So coming from Detroit, how come you chose the University of Oregon? Uh, at the time, shoot, Oregon was the only high major school that was recruiting me. And uh, I actually had a teammate, a high school teammate, who was two years older than me, uh, that went along and went to Oregon, Malik Harrison. And that's how Oregon discovered me. Um, they were recruiting him. And uh, they seen me. And they came back a couple of years later and, and offered me a scholarship. So I kind of just stuck with my my commitment. And uh, after doing research, um, Oregon was the best fit uh, for me. Um, so, and it, and it turns out to be one of the best decisions I've ever made. What were your first impressions? On my visit, I thought it was uh, a little weird. Um, Malik was my host, who was my friend. Um, uh, he went to high school. We went to high school together. So he was my host on my visit. And uh, we were going to uh, his math class. You know, he was kind of touring around, and I was uh, on his daily schedule. And, you know, <laughs> uh, we were walking to his math class, and a guy jumps out of the tree um, out of nowhere, scared the death out of me. And it happened to be our, our center, Ray Schaefer. Uh, so I thought that was really weird that he jumped out of a tree. He was up in the tree reading the book. Uh, but he surprised us because I guess he's seen us from a bird's eye view. But um, yeah, so that I, I found that really weird. Uh, but it was also green. Uh, the the air was different, smelled different. Um, I never been around a, a bunch of people that uh, were just so nice and so helpful. So my first impressions was uh, it was I was on edge because it was an unfamiliar territory, but. Um, it, it is one of the best places I've ever been. Okay. Yeah. And um, once, I guess once um, you committed, what, how'd your impression change? It was pretty much the same um, because I had to get used to being in that environment, uh, being around, you know, where I'm from, Detroit, you mean you can walk up and down the street and people are not going to say anything to you. And then I go across the country and, everybody's speaking to you. Um, you walking down the street, everybody's saying hello, they're polite, they're helpful. Um, so um, it wasn't a shock, it was just different. You know, everybody's being nice, everybody's being helpful. And um, and I'm, I'm, I'm from a city, you know, I'm from a major city. Um, so Detroit was totally different from Oregon. Um, but I mean, the the people there embrace you, embrace you. Uh, they celebrate you. They, like I said, they're very helpful. So um, my my impressions didn't change. It just it was an adjustment for me to to try to get used to um, in being in that environment and, and accepting and being accepting and not being so on the defense of oh why are they talking to me or. Um, why are they so nice to me at this time? But I mean, that's just, it was just a friendly environment. You set a school record your freshman year of most three pointers. I think it was 110 made in a season. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how was that your fresh, like being a freshman and setting such a big record? I think you don't really understand the magnitude of what you're doing until you actually leave. But during the time, I didn't, didn't think much of it. Um, I was just kind of in the moment and still really trying to prove that I can play at that level, you know, uh, coming from here, even close family and uh, friends who doubted me, who didn't think I could play at that level. So um, I kind of had like a chip on my shoulder and I kind of wanted to prove everybody wrong. So I really wasn't in the business or actually patting myself on the back as to what I was doing. but. Um, so uh, in that mind frame, you you really oblivious to everything. You know, I didn't know, I really didn't know what I was doing. I just kept pushing forward, pushing forward. And, but now to actually look back at it is, is quite unique. Getting more achievements throughout your career, did it kind of fuel you even more like coming back and just reliving like, yeah, I broke a record my freshman year and that kind of motivated you to try and break more? Absolutely. Um, I think 
um, probably after that season, I got a chance to reflect and um, it, it, it was quite amazing um, what I've done. I mean, I'm not the type that will boast or um, to be conceited, but um, I wasn't impressed with myself because I knew what um, I was capable of, but it kind of gave me extra motivation to keep going, to see what else I can do. Um, so you really don't, like I said, you really don't, as a competitor, you really don't get into all the individual accolades. Um, I mean, with the press, of course, me getting more publicity, um, it draws more attention to it. But me, um, my upbringing has just taught me to just stay focused, you know, and I always kept my eyes moving forward. Um, you welcome the the individual attention, of course, but I mean, you don't uh, stay set in stone on that. You know, you just kind of keep moving forward. And but right now, as I can reflect on it, I mean, it's it's really it's monumental. You know, so uh, I can't say enough about that 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 achievement. Yeah, and um, kind of you saying that you were staying humble and things like that. Do you think because you played under Ernie Kent and you played with Aaron Brooks? How how do you think that kind of helped you um, stay focused? Well, I don't know if it helped me stay focused uh, because no no disrespect to Ernie Kent. Ernie Kent and Aaron Brooks are two of the best people I ever met in my life. But it's just a twist to to the, that question. Um, uh, Aaron Brooks, he was a senior. Um, he had a lot of personal things going on with himself and. You know, you have a freshman coming in uh, who plays the same position as you. So he really kind of seen me as a threat. Um, so it wasn't much buddy-buddy going on there. And then uh, Ernie Kent, you know, he still had 14 other players, Yeah. you know, to, to attend to. And it was really – it was three other freshmen in our class, you know. So Ernie Kent still had a job. It wasn't so much of them um, – trying to prepare me or making that transition to play division one basketball, but so much of, uh, you're here now, you know, um, now it's time to play. So I think much of my, my transition started before, um, but I had an older brother who was coaching college basketball. So I was able to sit in in some of those uh, practices and see how things were ran and see how things are, being uh you know diagram and from a division one coach's point of view and then you know i have a, a high school coach who was who ran our high school program like a college it was college like college preparatory so um uh, i i give a lot of my credit to my upbringing because they prepared me but once i got there it was time to play so they, ernie kent didn't have no time for babysitting and aaron brooks didn't really have any time to be buddy buddy with someone he he uh found a threat <laughs> yeah um yeah that that was kind of one thing that I always wondered was because I know you guys played the same position and yeah Aaron was actually uh him and another senior was actually in charge of picking the freshman up to go to weights in the morning for uh, during the summer the bridge program so while we were in summer school and we already had two scheduled days to go on the track, which was, I think it's like Tuesday and Thursday. So if you're late to wait, then you can't get in. They won't let you get in. So you just have to go on the track. And at least two extra times a week, uh, Aaron will leave me and, and go <laughs> and go straight like he would drive past the dorm. We were staying at Carson. I don't know if it's still a Carson uh, dorms on campus. So yeah. we were staying at Carson, and and we lived at Austin at that time. So uh, he would just drive past, and if I wasn't outside, he would just leave me. So I will have to go on a track at least four times a week now. And we had brutal track workouts. I mean, brutal track workouts, and we ran from those tracks. So we you didn't really want any extra days, but – yeah, Aaron, Aaron Brooks used to leave me. And we didn't really have much dialogue um, 
before, I mean, to like midway through the season, we didn't really have any dialogue. It was, you know, we show up to practice, we see each other, and that was it. Off the court, we had no dialogue. But midway through the season, uh, I think we kind of both loosened up and, and stopped being so competitive towards each other and was like, hey, we're in this thing together. In practice, yeah, we can go at it, but in the games, we're on the same team. So uh, I think we loosened up. Uh, our coaches became uh, – start putting us as roommates together on the road, and we build a relationship, and that's my guide to this day. We talk weekly, uh, several times a week, and uh, it, it's grown into a, a great friendship. And even with Ernie Kent, man, it, uh, it's somebody I still reach out to this day. Um, great guy, class act. I can't say enough about him. Um, so. Both of those uh, two people are um, really, um, they hold a special place uh, with me. Uh, we, our relationship go way beyond basketball. Watching games in that stadium was insane. Yeah, Matt Knight is really nice, but Matt Court, because it's so much smaller, it was, could, could you kind of talk me through how playing in that stadium was? It's no place like Matt Court to this day. Um, this is, I've been 10 years removed. There is no place like Mad Court. Um, the environment, the the arena itself, the pit, how, like you said, how everything was just so close. Uh, it was a little smaller, so you can feel the presence of the fans and the environment, man. And it used to get so loud, and then the rims used to shake. Uh, so it's, it's still one of my favorite places to play uh, in Mad Court, man. It's, uh, but it was time for an upgrade. It was outdated. So I know MacArthur Court is a, a lot better. We actually laid the first bricks to MacArthur Court. You know, I was supposed to play in MacArthur Court, but um, uh, the, the, re the construction date was pushed back so many times. So uh, I didn't get a chance to play there, but I seen a, I seen a game there. And it's definitely not the same. It's not the same, but um, it's definitely deserving. That school is definitely deserving of a new arena, a nice arena. And, uh, it, it is. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place. It's just not – it don't have the same homey feeling, but, I mean, definitely we generated uh, enough fans to, to be able to have more than what we held at Matt Court, for sure. After college, you went and played in the G League for a little bit, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. How – what was that experience like? Ooh, like a roller coaster. Um, and actually, my first uh, time going to the D League is when I left uh, college. I got drafted to the uh, main Red Claws, and I played well throughout training camp. And um, they even told my representation it was two days left in, in training camp before they had to send a final roster. Then and they told my representation, oh, he's good. He's on the team. And we had an open scrimmage left uh, to the public and maybe one more practice. And during that open scrimmage to the public, I didn't play so well. But it wasn't uh, that I didn't play so well. It was one guy who was having a terrible training camp play out of his mind. He played completely out of his mind. I'm talking about hitting every shot he – he threw up from fadeaways, step backs, all kind of. He was, he played unbelievable. No discredit, no discredit to him, but um, and he was deserving. But they called me in the next day, uh, towards the end of the uh, training camp, and it was like, yeah, we're gonna have to release you. So that's when I I learned like one bad day can determine what's or how it is moving forward. You know, so. That was my first stint, and the second stint is even even crazier. My second time I went uh, was with the the Vipers, the Real Grand Vipers, and if there wasn't no bad days in training camp, there wasn't no bad days in training camp, and they had to send the final rosters in, and the same thing happened. It was like we're we're gonna have to cut you. I know you've been playing well, but we're gonna have to cut you, cut you. But you can stick around for a little while, and you never know what will happen. 
You know, I didn't really have much going on. I had overseas offers, offers, but I I really wanted to play in the D League or the G League. So, um, I kind of just stuck around. So now I'm a practice player. I can practice, but I can't suit up for games. I can't sit on the bench for home games, and I can't travel. So I was pretty much a practice player for a whole week. I mean, for a whole month, month and a half. The team wasn't doing well. They were three and seven, and they were making the change. But anyway, I got a call, and they're in Dallas. And they call me on the day of the game they're supposed to play, and they said, hey, we're going to activate you today. We need you to get on a plane. You know, it's a couple of hours before game time, you know, a few hours before game time. So I had to get on the plane. By the time I get to Dallas, they are going gone to the arena for warm-up, you know, pre-game. So I had to get – I dropped my stuff at the hotel, get transportation to the game. And I don't even get a chance to warm up because I had to register. I had to do physicals. So by the time I come out, it's one minute left before the national anthem and start a lineup. So I kind of had to, you know, get myself ready and stretched out uh, on the bench during the game. And I didn't know what was going to happen or if I were even going to play. But I ended up, they ended up calling me, putting me in uh, during the second quarter, I believe. And I was playing well. But long story short, I ended up hitting the game winner Ooh. that game. So my, my first game being activated after being a practice player for uh, almost a month and a half, I end up hitting the game winner. Um, so uh, I have a lot of stories behind that because it wasn't – it's been an uphill battle. It's always been an uphill battle. But I, I kind of stuck with it. And, uh, you know, it, and, and that's, it's just a great story to tell, to be to, – to see or, you know, to to actually – see that I was able to overcome uh, such os- obstacles because I think some anybody else in my in my shoes would probably would have just left and went somewhere else but I believed I could play so I just stuck around and I kind of humbled myself it is humbling you know now I'm out of college um, probably one of the uh, premier colleges prestigious colleges in the in the, in the world and here I am uh, trying to establish myself in the professional world, and it wasn't going as planned. So, uh, and then I was actually able to play some games in a D league, and I and I thought I played quite well. Um, so, so it was it, like I said, it was it, it's been a, it was a roller coaster in the D league, uh, actually a, ro- a roller coaster. Yeah, I I, I looked up um, looked up your stats in the G league and everything like that, and that just hearing that story, that's that's crazy because I don't I don't know if a lot of people would have stayed for that month and a half. Yeah, that I that once I got the opportunity to play, um, actually Nick Nurse was my coach. Oh. During that time, so the the head coach of the Raptors right now, he was my he was my coach at the time. He always loved me. Um, uh, he always thought I was a great player, and it wasn't his decision for him uh for him to cut me. You know, he was taking orders above. You know, but I didn't know that back then, you know, so um, kind of putting things into perspective. Now, he he always said, like, man, I have no problem with you. I don't worry about what, uh, worry about you for anything, you know. So he actually gave me the opportunity to play. And I was so nervous that game. I, I can remember it was the third quarter. It was like 15 seconds left and it was a dead ball. And he was like. No, it was more than 15 seconds left because he said that he wanted the last shot. And and I was like, well, because Ro- the Rockets had a, a signee down, which was Scott Machado. And he was like, I want the last shot. And I was like, well, I was so nervous. I was like, well, do you want to bring Scott back in the game? Like on a dead ball? He was like, no. He was like, I want the last shot. And he told the whole team, like, go one for a flat. TP, I want you to shoot a three. And, you know, and I dribbled the clock out. Uh, and, and I shot a three, and I actually made it. I made it at the end of the quarter, man. So it, it, he gave me a lot of confidence, one of the probably the best coach I've ever had, um, because if he wasn't taking orders from up top, he would let me play. And he actually said that later on when they had to release me that. Um, he was like, man, I had no problems with you. He told me the truth. He was taking orders from up top. 
Um, so he was like, man, you, you were playing so well, you were about to get a call up, but it's a business, you know? So, you know, they ended up having to release me um, during that time or uh, after, after a while, they had to, they had to end up releasing me because they was going a different direction. But um, Nick Nurse, man, he, he gave me the, the ultimate green light when I was on the court. Um, do you think with how it's going now with the G League, um, well, yeah, now G League, um, do you think that it's, it's becoming more suitable for a league for players trying to make the NBA? It's becoming more attractive now. You know, back when I was playing, it was more, more so frowned, frowned upon. You know, people were like, oh, they don't get paid this much or you're not going to make it or, you know, but now they kind of, it's geared towards that, you know, um, and they're paying more. Um, the D lead is showing, I mean, the, the NBA is showing more interest and in putting more into the, to the G league. So yes, it's definitely more attractive and it's more, um, it's definitely a, a good role map to the NBA. Um, but a lot of people have the impression that, uh, if you go overseas, then you won't be able to make the NBA. But, you know, the NBA has great outstanding staff, uh, scout personnel. If you can play um, and, it, it, and it's for you, they will find you. But, I mean, the D-League where you keep them close, uh, yeah. So, I mean, they, they're more involved and, it's, like I said, it's more attractive uh, at this time. So, uh, especially high school uh talent top uh athletes is is way more attractive than going to school and having to deal with all the rules and so it it, it can get tricky but uh with the, with the way the NBA is now and how everything is projected it the D, the G League I keep saying D League the G League is more is 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 definitely a good route to go you you then went overseas um mm -hmm. correct if I was if I'm correct. Um, how no, how is how is that experience like? The same. It's the same, man, because it's a business too. But now the pressure is on you because usually when they bring an import in, especially an American import, you are the guy on the team. So you have to shoulder everything. You're a superstar. They expect you to do everything. So um, it comes with a lot more pressure. Um, and then it, it's business too, because sometimes you may not get paid. And, um, you in a foreign country, you really don't know how to speak their language, so you you have to maneuver how to get around. So it, it is a challenge, but it's one of the best things in the world too, to be able to travel and play basketball all around the world and experience another culture, another lifestyle too. So uh, it has its pros and its cons for sure. Uh, but more for me, more so uh, pros, because uh, I love, I love, I love going overseas and experiencing different countries, and uh, kind of like adapting and uh, adjusting to their lifestyle, and it makes you be more, more grateful of what you have here in America, because we can be, we can become real sadity, you know. Yeah. But being overseas makes you appreciate the things the things we have are that are more accessible in in America for sure. What what's something that you you tell your younger self if you could? Oh, I could tell that knucklehead a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> but um I would probably tell him um life doesn't always go as planned. Um be prepared for curveballs and adjust accordingly. You know, because a lot of times, um, like just with me getting cut and have to and have to to go through different trials and tribulations, I will kind of go into a shell or don't want to be bothered, don't want to talk, and and kind of be distant from everybody, uh, and kind of be down on myself. But I mean, it's life. Life doesn't always go as planned. You still continue on. You just find a different way to achieve your goals. You know, so that that's probably one 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 advice 
one thing I would probably tell myself because I can see myself being down a lot and being distant from a lot, a lot and, and disappearing. And people are like, oh man, where you been? Like, but really I was on in my own little funk. But uh, so that's one thing I would probably tell myself. Okay. And is is there really is there anything that you're looking forward to in the in the future? I think once the ball stop bouncing, uh, probably coaching or scouting and uh, staying around the game, but from a different aspect. You know, um, I have a four year old son, so I'm looking forward to being more more stationary, more stable, and uh, watching him grow. Um, and I have a, a few business ventures brewing. So um, I think probably just being more stationary. I'm excited. But right now I'm still dribbling the basketball. Who knows where it's going to go or how, how long I'm going to do it. But uh, definitely um, just life itself, man. Every day is it's, it's a challenge. I'm happy to, to be alive and join the, uh, the goodness of God, man. So I can't complain.